Hey, Discipleship Groups, Matt here, and we are in the last week of Discipleship Groups, and I wanted to take a moment to talk about a psalm I had not planned on teaching. Uh, so originally, I was going to talk about Psalm 139, just because there's so much good truth on just the omnipotence of God and incredible aspects of His character. Um, but as I was reading this past week, I was convicted about my personal response to Psalm 137. Um, how many of y'all read Psalm 137 and were like, I want to go to the next one? That was me, and I did. And about halfway through the day, I was just wrestling and I was processing it. And I was like, I really need to go dig into Psalm 137. Um, and the reason why I think it's significant is because Psalm 137 reveals parts of God, God's character that through our cultural lens, we don't necessarily see. Um, because Psalm 137 is written through the lens of the powerless Jew in exile, the one who had lost and had suffering. And I think it's hard for us sometimes to identify with the loss and grief that they were facing. And so I want to walk through this psalm because in it, I think um, it'll help us see a, a part of God's character that we um, maybe don't always give full credit to. And so uh, we're going to jump into Psalm 137 and attempt to kind of process some very difficult words and, in my opinion, some of the most one of the most difficult texts in Scripture. And so uh, we see in the first four verses, we see the psalmist mourning, this lament. We've read several lamenting psalms. Um, this psalm in particular, the psalmist is um, being mocked by the Babylonians being asked to sing the songs of their people. And basically the psalmist is weeping by the river. Um, it's hanging their instruments in the tree, basically saying, hey, for a season we're giving this up because we are just mourning and we're weeping over this. And then the Babylonians are asking them to sing and in response, the, the psalmist is like, how can we sing of, of Jerusalem and better yet, maybe God's faithfulness or who God is um, in the midst of this mourning and suffering? I think it's important the psalmist gives us permission to mourn and grieve. It's something that we don't like to do, um, but I think it's important just like to, like to feel all the feels, um, but just it, it's okay to mourn, it's okay to grieve. What the psalmist then does is verses five and six begin this oath um, where basically it's like, hey, um, I will, if I forget Jerusalem, uh, may um, my hands forget the skill that they have and that the roof of my mouth or the tongue would stick to the roof of my mouth, which these sound weird, but it's like widely believed and there's a lot of evidence that the author of this were those who led worship um, within the temple and for the Jewish people. And so basically what, this, what the psalmist is believed to be saying here is like, hey Lord, I'm going to give up what's most valuable if I were to forget who you are and forget of you. Um, and so it's saying, hey, like, I don't want to forget of, of God and what he's done in and through my people symbolized in Jerusalem. And then, and then we get to some very wonky verses. So we have a lament, we have an oath, and then we have um, a curse. We have an imprecatory part of the psalm right here where there's two curses. One against, is against the Edomites, which if you uh, need a refresher, the Edomites are descendants of Esau. I'll come to that in a minute. And then a curse against the Babylonians. So why is the Edomites in significance? Well, the Edomites um, are almost like a kin to the, Israel, to the Israelites. They are distant relatives of Esau. And basically they're saying, hey, you've betrayed us, Edom. Edomites, even though you are kin and we are separate, um, but you've betrayed us and there's this kinship um, kind of like the, the Edomites rejected this kinship norm of being there for um, your brother or your kin. And so um, he's calling for a curse on them. And what's interesting is, uh, what, what's, what's also significant is the language of this. In the CSB it says, destroy it, destroy it, destroy it to its foundations. Um, that's what the Edomites said of Israel. What it's saying, what a better translation for that would be this idea of exposure. And the words here are actually used about 30 something times through all the Old Testament in exposure to nakedness. Um, and so like, um, if uh, you've ever been in that situation, like it's embarrassing, uh, it's humiliating. 
And so basically, like, the Edomites were cheering on the embarrassment and exposure of the Israelite people. And then he gets to Babylon. And uh, Babylon is those who captured them and uh, who, who did some really terrible things. And it's calling and saying, hey, doomed daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you um, for what you've done for us. Happy is the one uh, who takes your little one and dashes them against the rocks. Yikes. Um, not exactly the most Christian or Sunday school response to those who have wronged you. What happened to turn the other cheek? What about this? Well, it's, the language is here is really important. At the end of verse 8, it says, who pays you back? Some, but the, the, the short translation would be, who repays you? Okay. What the psalmist is saying here is, hey, uh, would God, would you repay them for what they've done to us? And if you look in Lamentations chapter 4 and you look at a couple of other instances of Scripture, one of the things that they did was they killed uh, many of the children of the nobles. And they also took many in exile, but they killed a large, uh, a large population of children within Jerusalem. And so the psalmist here isn't just like in anger saying, I hope your children die. What he's saying is, hey, Lord, would you repay them for what they've done to us? And this isn't just a response out of anger, but it's saying, hey, Lord, like, look what they've done to us. God, would you pay them back in some way? And the only way that their language would express it is an eye for an eye, which is a Babylonian concept, which is interesting. And I'm not going to get into that because I'll be getting in the weeds. But this idea of, Lord, would you pay them back for what they've done for us? And so um, what do we do with this song? Like, what do we do? Um, and I think that our, our cultural lens can sometimes make passages like this difficult because we live in such an era of prosperity. And I'm not saying the prosperity that we have is bad, but I do think that it blinds us as we approach Scripture. It's very difficult for us to, be, um, to view ourselves as completely powerless in a situation. Um, here in America, we have the blessing of a lot of freedom and a lot of prosperity. And regardless of of um, maybe some of the circumstances we might be facing, we have a lot of agency to control our future. We can go work, we can go earn a living. There's a lot of opportunity to, um, to have upward mobility, so to speak. And the psalmist here is praying in a way because they have no power. The future is really, really, really bleak. The Babylonians will, very, are not giving them a way for upward mobility, are not giving them a way for the, the generations to grow and to, to, to be able to think in a long-term mindset. It's, uh, they're in survival mode. And so this psalm is, is, is a cry, so to speak, against unchecked power. It's saying, hey God, there is unchecked power in, in my life and we need you to respond because this is greater than anything um, that's around us. The second thing that is important for us, again, we are not always framed this way because we have a lot of agency, is, is that God is a God of justice and He will bring justice in the face of severe injustice. Um, ultimately, God will have the final say over all injustice that we see in this world. That does not excuse us for acting right. That does not excuse us for stepping in and reconciling things that we have the power and the position to step into. But what this does say is when we look around the world, we see a lot of injustice. And it can be overwhelming. You know, one of the biggest questions is, hey, how can God be a loving God with so much hurt and suffering around the world? And it's important to frame that and be like, hey, that suffering is a result of being in a fallen world. But ultimately, God is going to have the final say. God is going to have the final say. And He is the ultimate power. He is the one who's going to come and restore. He's the one who's going to hold the powers and principalities accountable for what they've done. He's going to hold each individual person uh, accountable for what they've done. And those who are found in the blood of Jesus, they um, will, they, they've been bought with a price. They have justified before God. And it honestly reminds me of Romans 8, 38 and 39, where it's talking about the power of God and how nothing can separate us, not, um, lot, n not death, nor life, nor anything angels or rulers nor things present or things to come um, can separate us from the love of God. And this psalm is such an interesting psalm to read in parallel with that because um, 
in the face of unchecked power, there is this God who's powerful over all things. And nothing can separate those who love Him and fear Him. So, for us, what does that mean we do? What is, how does this apply for us? Well, I think it reminds us of the goodness of God's character. And he's always faithful. He's all-powerful. And that we can rest and that He's going to step into injustice in this world. It might not be until the end. And so I think this reveals an interesting part of God's character and something that we miss. And so I hope this has been helpful. There's so many different rabbit trails to go down on this song, but I hope this has just helped give a little bit of a, of a help as you've approached a really difficult text. I'll see you soon.